Matthew, chapter 1. The family tree of Jesus Christ, David's son, Abraham's son. Abraham had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob, Jacob had Judah and his brothers. Judah had Perez and Zerah, the mother was Tamar. Perez had Hezron, Hezron had Aram, Aram had Aminadab, Aminadab had Nishon. Nishon had Salmon, Salmon had Boaz, his mother was Rahab. Boaz had Obed, Ruth was the mother, Obed had Jesse, Jesse had David, and David became king. David had Solomon, Uriah's wife was the mother. Solomon had Rehoboam, Rehoboam had Abijah, Abijah had Asa, Asa had Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat had Joram, Joram had Uzziah, Uzziah had Jotham, Jotham had Ahaz, Ahaz had Hezekiah, Hezekiah had Manasseh, Manasseh had Amon, Amon had Josiah, Josiah had Jehoiakim and his brothers, and then the people were taken into the Babylonian exile. When the Babylonian exile ended, Jehoiakim had Shealtiel, Shealtiel had Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel had Abiud, Abiud had Eliakim, Eliakim had Azor, Azor had Zadok, Zadok had Achim, Achim had Eliad, Eliad had Eleazar, Eleazar had Matan, Matan had Jacob, Jacob had Joseph, Mary's husband, the Mary who gave birth to Jesus, the Jesus who was called Christ. There were fourteen generations from Abraham to David, another fourteen from David to the Babylonian exile, and yet another fourteen from the Babylonian exile to Christ. The Birth of Jesus The birth of Jesus took place like this. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. Before they came to the marriage bed, Joseph discovered she was pregnant. It was by the Holy Spirit, but he didn't know that. Joseph, chagrined but noble, determined to take care of things quietly so Mary would not be disgraced. While he was trying to figure a way out, he had a dream. God's angel spoke in the dream. Joseph, son of David, don't hesitate to get married. Mary's pregnancy is spirit-conceived. God's Holy Spirit has made her pregnant. She will bring a son to birth, and when she does, you, Joseph, will name him Jesus. God saves, because he will save his people from their sins. This would bring the prophet's embryonic sermon to full term. Watch for this. A virgin will get pregnant and bear a son. They will name him Emmanuel, Hebrew, for God is with us. Then Joseph woke up. He did exactly what God's angel commanded in the dream. He married Mary, but he did not consummate the marriage until she had the baby. He named the baby Jesus. Scholars from the East Chapter 2 After Jesus was born in Bethlehem village, Judah territory, this was during Herod's kingship, a band of scholars arrived in Jerusalem from the East. They asked around, Where can we find and pay homage to the newborn king of the Jews? We observed a star in the eastern sky that signaled his birth. We're on pilgrimage to worship him. When word of their inquiry got to Herod, he was terrified. And not Herod alone, but most of Jerusalem as well. Herod lost no time. He gathered all the high priests and religion scholars in the city together and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? They told him, Bethlehem, Judah territory. The prophet Micah wrote it plainly. It's you, Bethlehem, in Judah's land, no longer bringing up the rear. From you will come the leader who will shepherd rule my people, my Israel. Herod then arranged a secret meeting with the scholars from the east. Pretending to be as devout as they were, he got them to tell him exactly when the birth announcement star appeared. Then he told them the prophecy about Bethlehem and said, Go, find this child, leave no stone unturned. As soon as you find him, send word and I'll join you at once in your worship. Instructed by the king, they set off. Then the star appeared again, the same star they had seen in the eastern skies. It led them on until it hovered over the place of the child. They could hardly contain themselves. They were in the right place. They had arrived at the right time. They entered the house and saw the child in the arms of Mary, his mother. Overcome, they kneeled and worshipped him. 
Then they opened their luggage and presented gifts. Gold, frankincense, myrrh. In a dream, they were warned not to report back to Herod. So they worked out another route, left the territory without being seen, and returned to their own country. After the scholars were gone, God's angel showed up again in Joseph's dream and commanded, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. Stay until further notice. Herod is on the hunt for this child and wants to kill him. Joseph obeyed. He got up, took the child and his mother under cover of darkness. They were out of town and well on their way by daylight. They lived in Egypt until Herod's death. This Egyptian exile fulfilled what Hosea had preached. I called my son out of Egypt. Herod, when he realized that the scholars had tricked him, flew into a rage. He commanded the murder of every little boy two years old and under who lived in Bethlehem and its surrounding hills. He determined that age from information he'd gotten from the scholars. That's when Jeremiah's sermon was fulfilled. A sound was heard in Ramah, weeping and much lament. Rachel weeping for her children, Rachel refusing all solace, her children gone, dead, and buried. Later, when Herod died, God's angel appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Up, take the child and his mother and return to Israel. All those out to murder the child are dead. Joseph obeyed. He got up, took the child and his mother, and re-entered Israel. When he heard, though, that Archelaus had succeeded his father, Herod, as king in Judea, he was afraid to go there. But then Joseph was directed in a dream to go to the hills of Galilee. On arrival, he settled in the village of Nazareth. This mood was a fulfillment of the prophetic words, He shall be called a Nazarene. Thunder in the Desert Chapter 3 While Jesus was living in the Galilean hills, John, called the baptizer, was preaching in the desert country of Judea. His message was simple and austere, like his desert surroundings. Change your life. God's kingdom is here. John and his message were authorized by Isaiah's prophecy. Thunder in the desert. Prepare for God's arrival. Make the road smooth and straight. John dressed in a camel hair habit tied at the waist by a leather strap. He lived on a diet of locusts and wild field honey. People poured out of Jerusalem, Judea, and the Jordanian countryside to hear and see him in action. There, at the Jordan River, those who came to confess their sins were baptized into a changed life. When John realized that a lot of Pharisees and Sadducees were showing up for a baptismal experience because it was becoming the popular thing to do, he exploded. Brood of snakes, what do you think you're doing slithering down here to the river? Do you think a little water on your snakeskins is going to make any difference? It's your life that must change, not your skin. And don't think you can pull rank by claiming Abraham as father. Being a descendant of Abraham is neither here nor there. Descendants of Abraham are a dime a dozen. What counts is your life. Is it green and blossoming? Because if it's dead wood, it goes on the fire. I'm baptizing you here in the river, turning your old life in for a kingdom life. The real action comes next. The main character in this drama... Compared to him, I'm a mere stagehand. We'll ignite the kingdom life within you, a fire within you, the Holy Spirit within you, changing you from the inside out. He's going to clean house, make a clean sweep of your lives. He'll place everything true in its proper place before God. Everything false, he'll put out with the trash to be burned. Jesus then appeared, arriving at the Jordan River from Galilee. He wanted John to baptize him. John objected. I'm the one who needs to be baptized, not you. But Jesus insisted. Do it. God's work, putting things right all these centuries, is coming together right now in this baptism. So John did it. The moment Jesus came up out of the baptismal waters, the skies opened and he saw God's Spirit. It looked like a dove descending and landing on him. And along with the Spirit, a voice. This is my Son chosen and marked by my love, delight of my life. The Test Chapter 4 Next, Jesus was taken into the wild by the Spirit for the test. The devil was ready to give it. Jesus prepared for the test by fasting forty days and forty nights. 
That left him, of course, in a state of extreme hunger, which the devil took advantage of in the first test. Since you are God's son, speak the word that will turn these stones into loaves of bread. Jesus answered by quoting Deuteronomy. It takes more than bread to stay alive. It takes a steady stream of words from God's mouth. For the second test, the devil took him to the holy city. He sat him on top of the temple and said, Since you are God's son, jump. The devil goaded him by quoting Psalm 91. He has placed you in the care of angels. They will catch you so that you won't so much as stub your toe on a stone. Jesus countered with another citation from Deuteronomy. Don't you dare test the Lord your God. For the third test, the devil took him on the peak of a huge mountain. He gestured expansively, pointing out all the earth's kingdoms, how glorious they all were. Then he said, They're yours. Lock, stock, and barrel. Just go down on your knees and worship me, and they're yours. Jesus' refusal was curt. Beat it, Satan. He backed his rebuke with a third quotation from Deuteronomy. Worship the Lord your God and only Him. Serve Him with absolute single-heartedness. The test was over. The devil left. And in his place, angels. Angels came and took care of Jesus' needs. Teaching and Healing When Jesus got word that John had been arrested, he returned to Galilee. He moved from his hometown, Nazareth, to the lakeside village, Capernaum, nestled at the base of the Zebulun and Naphtali hills. This move completed Isaiah's sermon. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, road to the sea over Jordan, Galilee, crossroads for the nations, people sitting out their lives in the dark saw a huge light. Sitting in that dark, dark country of death, they watched the sun come up. This Isaiah prophesied sermon came to life in Galilee the moment Jesus started preaching. He picked up where John left off. Change your life. God's kingdom is here. Walking along the beach of Lake Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, later called Peter, and Andrew. They were fishing, throwing their nets into the lake. It was their regular work. Jesus said to them, Come with me. I'll make a new kind of fisherman out of you. I'll show you how to catch men and women instead of perch and bass. They didn't ask questions, but simply dropped their nets and followed. A short distance down the beach, they came upon another pair of brothers, James and John, Zebedee's sons. These two were sitting in a boat with their father, Zebedee, mending their fish nets. Jesus made the same offer to them, and they were just as quick to follow, abandoning boat and father. From there, he went all over Galilee. He used synagogues for meeting places and taught people the truth of God. God's kingdom was his theme, that beginning right now, they were under God's government, a good government. He also healed people of their diseases and of the bad effects of their bad lives. Word got around the entire Roman province of Syria. People brought anybody with an ailment, whether mental, emotional, or physical. Jesus healed them, one and all. More and more people came, the momentum gathering. Besides those from Galilee, crowds came from the ten towns across the lake, others up from Jerusalem and Judea, still others from across the Jordan. You are blessed. Chapter 5 When Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed a hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him, but committed, climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions. This is what he said. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there's more of God and his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are, no more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink and the best meal you'll ever eat. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you'll find yourselves cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. 
You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. Not only that, count yourselves blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Give a cheer even, for though they don't like it, I do. And all heaven applauds. And know that you are in good company. My prophets and witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. Salt and light. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. Completing God's Law Don't suppose for a minute that I've come to demolish the scriptures, either God's law or the prophets. I'm not here to demolish, but to complete. I'm going to put it all together, pull it all together in a vast panorama. God's law is more real and lasting than the stars in the sky and the ground at your feet. Long after stars burn out and earth wears out, God's law will be alive and working. Trivialize even the smallest item in God's law, and you will only have trivialized yourself. But take it seriously, show the way for others, and you will find honor in the kingdom. Unless you do far better than the Pharisees in the matters of right living, you won't know the first thing about entering the kingdom. Murder you are familiar with the command to the ancients, do not murder. I'm telling you that anyone who is so much as angry with a brother or sister is guilty of murder. Carelessly call a brother idiot and you just might find yourself hauled into court. Thoughtlessly yell stupid at a sister and you're on the brink of hellfire. The simple moral fact is that words kill. This is how I want you to conduct yourself in these matters. If you enter your place of worship and, about to make an offering, you suddenly remember a grudge a friend has against you. Abandon your offering. Leave immediately. Go to this friend and make things right. Then, and only then, come back and work things out with God. Or, say you're out on the street and an old enemy accosts you. Don't lose a minute. Make the first move. Make things right with him. After all, if you leave the first move to him, knowing his track record, you're likely to end up in court, maybe even jail. If that happens, you won't get out without a stiff fine. Adultery and Divorce You know the next commandment pretty well, too. Don't go to bed with another spouse. But don't think you've preserved your virtue simply by staying out of bed. Your heart can be corrupted by lust even quicker than your body. Those leering looks you think nobody notices, they also corrupt. Let's not pretend this is easier than it really is. If you want to live a morally pure life, here's what you have to do. You have to blind your right eye the moment you catch it in a lustful leer. You have to choose to live one-eyed or else be dumped on a moral trash pile. And you have to chop off your right hand the moment you notice it raised threateningly. Better a bloody stump than your entire being discarded for good in the dump. Remember the scripture that says, whoever divorces his wife, let him do it legally, giving her divorce papers and her legal rights? Too many of you are using that as a cover for selfishness and whim, pretending to be righteous just because you are legal. Please, no more pretending. If you divorce your wife, you're responsible for making her an adulteress, unless she has already made herself that by sexual promiscuity. And if you marry such a divorced adulteress, you're automatically an adulterer yourself. You can't use legal cover to mask a moral failure. Empty promises. And don't say anything you don't mean. This counsel is embedded deep in our traditions. You only make things worse when you lay down a smokescreen of pious talk, saying, I'll pray for you, and never doing it, or saying, God be with you, and not meaning it. 
You don't make your words true by embellishing them with religious lace. In making your speech sound more religious, it becomes less true. Just say yes and no. When you manipulate words to get your own way, you go wrong. Love your enemies. Here's another old saying that deserves a second look. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Is that going to get us anywhere? Here's what I propose. Don't hit back at all. If someone strikes you, stand there and take it. If someone drags you into court and sues you for the shirt off your back, gift wrap your best coat and make a present of it. And if someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. No more tit-for-tat stuff. Live generously. You're familiar with the old written law, love your friend, and its unwritten companion, hate your enemy. I'm challenging that. I'm telling you to love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the energies of prayer, for then you are working out your true selves, your God-created selves. This is what God does. He gives His best, the sun to warm and the rain to nourish, to everyone, regardless, the good and bad, the nice and nasty. If all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect a medal? Any run-of-the-mill sinner does that. In a word, what I'm saying is, grow up. Your kingdom subjects, now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously toward others, the way God lives toward you. The world is not a stage. Chapter 6 Be especially careful when you are trying to be good, so that you don't make a performance out of it. It might be good theater, but the God who made you won't be applauding. When you do something for someone else, don't call attention to yourself. You've seen them in action, I'm sure. Play actors, I call them. Treating prayer meeting and street corner alike as a stage. Acting compassionate as long as someone is watching. Playing to the crowds. They get applause, true, but that's all they get. When you help someone out, don't think about how it looks. Just do it, quietly and unobtrusively. That is the way your God, who conceived you in love, working behind the scenes, helps you out. Pray with simplicity. And when you come before God, don't turn that into a theatrical production either. All of these people making a regular show out of their prayers, hoping for stardom? Do you think God sits in a box seat? Here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God and you will begin to sense His grace. The world is full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant. They're full of formulas and programs and advice, peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. Don't fall for that nonsense. This is your Father you are dealing with, and He knows better than you what you need. With a God like this loving you, you can pray very simply, like this. Our Father in Heaven, reveal who you are set the world right. Do what's best. As above, so below. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. You're ablaze in beauty. Yes, yes, yes. In prayer, there's a connection between what God does and what you do. You can't get forgiveness from God, for instance, without also forgiving others. If you refuse to do your part, you cut yourself off from God's part. When you practice some appetite-denying discipline to better concentrate on God, don't make a production out of it. It might turn you into a small-time celebrity, but it won't make you a saint. If you go into training inwardly, act normal outwardly. Shampoo and comb your hair, brush your teeth, wash your face. God doesn't require attention-getting devices. He won't overlook what you are doing. He'll reward you well. A life of God worship. Don't hoard treasure down here where it gets eaten by moths and corroded by rust, or worse, stolen by burglars. Stockpile treasure in heaven where it's safe from moth and rust and burglars. 
It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is, is the place you will most want to be and end up being. Your eyes are windows into your body. If you open your eyes wide in wonder and belief, your body fills up with light. If you live squinty-eyed in greed and distrust, your body is a dank cellar. If you pull the blinds on your windows, what a dark life you will have. You can't worship two gods at once. Loving one god, you'll end up hating the other. Adoration of one feeds contempt for the other. You can't worship God and money both. If you decide for God, living a life of God worship, it follows that you don't fuss about what's on the table at mealtimes or whether the clothes in your closet are in fashion. There's far more to your life than the food you put in your stomach, more to your outer appearance than the clothes you hang on your body. Look at the birds, free and unfettered, not tied down to a job description, careless in the care of God. And you count far more to him than birds. Has anyone, by fussing in front of the mirror, ever gotten taller by so much as an inch? All this time and money wasted on fashion, do you think it makes that much difference? Instead of looking at the fashions, walk out into the fields and look at the wildflowers. They never primp or shop, but have you ever seen color and design quite like it? The ten best-dressed men and women in the country look shabby alongside them. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never even seen, don't you think he'll attend to you, take pride in you, do his best for you? What I'm trying to do here is get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting, so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things. But you know both God and how he works. Steep your life in God reality. God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. A Simple Guide for Behavior Chapter 7 Don't pick on people, jump on their failures criticize their faults unless, of course, you want the same treatment. That critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. It's easy to see a smudge on your neighbor's face and be oblivious to the ugly sneer on your own. Do you have the nerve to say, let me wash your face for you, when your own face is distorted by contempt? It's this whole traveling roadshow mentality all over again, playing a holier-than-thou part instead of just living your part. Wipe that ugly sneer off your own face, and you might be fit to offer a washcloth to your neighbor. Don't be flip with the sacred. Banter and silliness give no honor to God. Don't reduce holy mysteries to slogans. In trying to be relevant, you're only being cute and inviting sacrilege. Don't bargain with God. Be direct. Ask for what you need. This isn't a cat-and-mouse hide-and-seek game we're in. If your child asks for bread... Do you trick him with sawdust? If he asks for fish, do you scare him with a live snake on his plate? As bad as you are, you wouldn't think of such a thing. You're at least decent to your own children. So don't you think the God who conceived you in love will be even better? Here is a simple rule of thumb guide for behavior. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you. Then grab the initiative and do it for them. Add up God's law and the prophets, and this is what you get. Being and doing. Don't look for shortcuts to God. The market is flooded with surefire, easygoing formulas for a successful life that can be practiced in your spare time. Don't fall for that stuff, even though crowds of people do. The way to life, to God, is vigorous and requires total attention. Be wary of false preachers who smile a lot dripping with practiced sincerity. Chances are they're out to rip you off in some way or other. Don't be impressed with charisma. Look for character. Who preachers are is the main thing, not what they say. A genuine leader will never exploit your emotions or your pocketbook. These diseased trees with their bad apples are going to be chopped down and burned. Knowing the correct password, saying master, master, for instance, isn't going to get you anywhere with me. What is required is serious obedience, doing what my father wills. I, I can see it now. At the final judgment, 
thousands strutting up to me and saying, Master, we preached the message. We bashed the demons. Our God-sponsored projects had everyone talking. And do you know what I'm going to say? You missed the boat. All you did was use me to make yourselves important. You don't impress me one bit. You're out of here. These words I speak to you are not incidental additions to your life homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundational words, words to build a life on. If you work these words into your life, you're like a smart carpenter who built his house on solid rock. Rain poured down, the river flooded, a tornado hit, but nothing moved that house. It was fixed to the rock. But if you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work them into your life, you're like a stupid carpenter who built his house on the sandy beach. When a storm rolled in and the waves came up, It collapsed like a house of cards. When Jesus concluded his address, the crowd burst into applause. They had never heard teaching like this. It was apparent that he was living everything he was saying, quite a contrast to their religion teachers. This was the best teaching they had ever heard. He carried our diseases. Chapter 8 Jesus came down the mountain with the cheers of the crowd still ringing in his ears. Then a leper appeared and went to his knees before Jesus, praying, Master, if you want to, you can heal my body. Jesus reached out and touched him, saying, I want to. Be clean. Then and there, all signs of the leprosy were gone. Jesus said, Don't talk about this all over town. Just quietly present your healed body to the priest, along with the appropriate expressions of thanks to God. Your cleansed and grateful life, not your words, will bear witness to what I have done. As Jesus entered the village of Capernaum, a Roman captain came up in a panic and said, Master, my servant is sick. He can't walk. He's in terrible pain. Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. Oh no, said the captain. I don't want to put you to all that trouble. Just give the order and my servant will be fine. I'm a man who takes orders and gives orders. I tell one soldier, go, and he goes, to another, come, and he comes, to my slave, do this, and he does it. Taken aback, Jesus said, I have yet to come across this kind of simple trust in Israel, the very people who are supposed to know all about God and how he works. This man is the vanguard of many outsiders who will soon be coming from all directions, streaming in from the east, pouring in from the west, sitting down at God's kingdom banquet alongside Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then those who grew up in the faith but had no faith will find themselves out in the cold, outsiders to grace and wondering what happened. Then Jesus turned to the captain and said, Go, what you believed could happen has happened. At that moment, his servant became well. By this time, they were in front of Peter's house. On entering, Jesus found Peter's mother-in-law sick in bed, burning up with fever. He touched her hand, and the fever was gone. No sooner was she up on her feet than she was fixing dinner for him. That evening, a lot of demon-afflicted people were brought to him. He relieved the inwardly tormented. He cured the bodily ill. He fulfilled Isaiah's well-known sermon. He took our illnesses. He carried our diseases. Your business is life, not death. When Jesus saw that a curious crowd was growing by the minute, he told his disciples to get him out of there to the other side of the lake. As they left, a religion scholar asked if he could go along. I'll go with you, wherever, he said. Jesus was curt. Are you ready to rough it? We're not staying in the best inns, you know. Another follower said, Master, excuse me for a couple of days, please. I have my father's funeral to take care of. Jesus refused. First things first. Your business is life, not death. Follow me. Pursue life. Then he got in the boat, his disciples with him. The next thing they knew, they were in a severe storm. Waves were crashing into the boat, and he was sound asleep. They roused him, pleading, Master, save us! We're going down! Jesus reprimanded them. Why are you such cowards, such faint hearts? Then he stood up and told the wind to be silent, the sea to quiet down. Silence! The sea became smooth as glass. The men rubbed their eyes, astonished. What's going on here? Wind and sea come to heal at his command. 
the madman and the pigs. They landed in the country of the Gadarenes and were met by two madmen, victims of demons coming out of the cemetery. The men had terrorized the region for so long that no one considered it safe to walk down that stretch of road anymore. Seeing Jesus, the madman screamed out, What business do you have giving us a hard time? You're the son of God. You weren't supposed to show up here yet. Off in the distance, a herd of pigs was browsing and rooting. The evil spirits begged Jesus, If you kick us out of these men, let us live in the pigs. Jesus said, Go ahead, but get out of here. Crazed, the pigs stampeded over a cliff into the sea and drowned. Scared to death, the swine herds bolted. They told everyone back in town what had happened to the madmen and the pigs. Those who heard about it were angry about the drowned pigs. A mob formed and demanded that Jesus get out and not come back. Who needs a doctor? Chapter 9 Back in the boat, Jesus and the disciples recrossed the sea to Jesus' hometown. They were hardly out of the boat when some men carried a paraplegic on a stretcher and set him down in front of them. Jesus, impressed by their bold belief, said to the paraplegic, Cheer up, son. I forgive your sins. Some religion scholars whispered, Why, that's blasphemy. Jesus knew what they were thinking and said, Why this gossipy whispering? Which do you think is simpler, to say, I forgive your sins, or get up and walk? Well, just so it's clear that I'm the Son of Man and authorized to do either or both. At this, he turned to the paraplegic and said, Get up, take your bed, and go home. And the man did it. The crowd was awestruck, amazed and pleased that God had authorized Jesus to work among them this way. Passing along, Jesus saw a man at his work collecting taxes. His name was Matthew. Jesus said, Come along with me. Matthew stood up and followed him. Later, when Jesus was eating supper at Matthew's house with his close followers, a lot of disreputable characters came and joined them. When the Pharisees saw him keeping this kind of company, they had a fit and lit into Jesus' followers. What kind of example is this from your teacher, acting cozy with crooks and riffraff? Jesus, overhearing, shot back. Who needs a doctor, the healthy or the sick? Go figure out what this scripture means. I'm after mercy, not religion. I'm here to invite outsiders, not coddle insiders. Kingdom Come A little later, John's followers approached, asking, Why is it that we and the Pharisees rigorously discipline body and spirit by fasting, but your followers don't? Jesus told them, When you're celebrating a wedding, you don't skimp on the cake and wine. You feast. Later, you may need to pull in your belt, but not now. No one throws cold water on a friendly bonfire. This is kingdom come. He went on, No one cuts up a fine silk scarf to patch old work clothes. You want fabrics that match, and you don't put your wine in cracked bottles. Just a touch. As he finished saying this, a local official appeared, bowed politely and said, My daughter has just now died. If you come and touch her, she will live. Jesus got up and went with him, his disciples following along. Just then, a woman who had hemorrhaged for twelve years slipped in from behind and lightly touched his robe. She was thinking to herself, If I can just put a finger on his robe, I'll get well. Jesus turned, caught her at it. Then he reassured her, Courage, daughter. You took a risk of faith, and now you are well. The woman was well from then on. By now they had arrived at the house of the town official and pushed their way through the gossips looking for a story and the neighbors bringing in casseroles. Jesus was abrupt. Clear out! This girl isn't dead. She's sleeping. They told him he didn't know what he was talking about. But when Jesus had gotten rid of the crowd, he went in, took the girl's hand, and pulled her to her feet, alive. The news was soon out and traveled throughout the region. Become what you believe. As Jesus left the house, he was followed by two blind men crying out, Mercy, son of David, mercy on us! When Jesus got home, the blind men went in with him. Jesus said to them, Do you really believe I can do this? They said, oh, Why, yes, master. He touched their eyes and said, Become what you believe. It happened. They saw. Then Jesus became very stern. 
Don't let a soul know how this happened. But they were hardly out the door before they started blabbing it to everyone they met. Right after that, as the blind men were leaving, a man who had been struck speechless by an evil spirit was brought to Jesus. As soon as Jesus threw the evil tormenting spirit out, the man talked away just as if he'd been talking all his life. The people were up on their feet applauding. There's never been anything like this in Israel. The Pharisees were left sputtering. Hocus pocus. It's nothing but hocus pocus. He's probably made a pact with the devil. Then Jesus made a circuit of all the towns and villages. He taught in their meeting places, reported kingdom news, and healed their diseased bodies, healed their bruised and hurt lives. When he looked out over the crowds, his heart broke. So confused and aimless they were, like sheep with no shepherd. What a huge harvest, he said to his disciples. How few workers. On your knees and pray for harvest hands. The Twelve Harvest Hands Chapter 10 The prayer was no sooner prayed than it was answered. Jesus called twelve of his followers and sent them into the ripe fields. He gave them power to kick out the evil spirits and to tenderly care for the bruised and hurt lives. This is the list of the twelve he sent. Simon, they called him Peter or Rock. Andrew, his brother. James, Zebedee's son. John, his brother. Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the taxman. James, son of Alphaeus. Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, Judas Iscariot, who later turned on him. Jesus sent his twelve harvest hands out with this charge. Don't begin by traveling to some far-off place to convert unbelievers, and don't try to be dramatic by tackling some public enemy. Go to the lost, confused people right here in the neighborhood. Tell them that the kingdom is here. Bring health to the sick. Raise the dead. Touch the untouchables. Kick out the demons. You have been treated generously, so live generously. Don't think that you have to put on a fundraising campaign before you start. You don't need a lot of equipment. You are the equipment, and all you need to keep that going is three meals a day. Travel light. When you enter a town or village, don't insist on staying in a luxury inn. Get a modest place with some modest people, and be content there until you leave. When you knock on a door, be courteous in your greeting. If they welcome you, be gentle in your conversation. If they don't welcome you, quietly withdraw. Don't make a scene. Shrug your shoulders and be on your way. You can be sure that on Judgment Day, they'll be mighty sorry. But it's no concern of yours now. Stay alert. This is hazardous work I'm assigning you. You're going to be like sheep running through a wolf pack. So don't call attention to yourselves. Be as cunning as a snake, inoffensive as a dove. Don't be naive. Some people will impugn your motives. Others will smear your reputation just because you believe in me. Don't be upset when they haul you before the civil authorities. Without knowing it, they've done you and me a favor, given you a platform for preaching the kingdom news. And don't worry about what you'll say or how you'll say it. The right words will be there. The spirit of your father will supply the words. When people realize it is the living God you are presenting and not some idol that makes them feel good, they're going to turn on you, even people in your own family. There is a great irony here, proclaiming so much love, experiencing so much hate. But don't quit. Don't cave in. It is all well worth it in the end. It's not success you're after in such times, but survival. Be survivors. Before you run out of options, the Son of Man will have arrived. A student doesn't get a better desk than her teacher. A laborer doesn't make more money than his boss. Be content, pleased even, when you, my students, my harvest hands, get the same treatment I get. If they call me the master, dung face, what can the workers expect? Don't be intimidated. Eventually everything is going to be out in the open, and everyone will know how things really are. So don't hesitate to go public now. Don't be bluffed into silence by the threats of bullies. There's nothing they can do to your soul, your core being. Save your fear for God, who holds your entire life, body and soul, in his hands. Forget about yourself. What's the price of a pet canary? Some loose change, right? And God cares what happens to it even more than you do. He pays even greater attention to you, down to the last detail, even numbering the hairs on your head. 
So don't be intimidated by all this bully talk. You're worth more than a million canaries. Stand up for me against world opinion, and I'll stand up for you before my Father in Heaven. If you turn tail and run, you think I'll cover for you? Don't think that I've come to make life cozy. I've come to cut. Make a sharp knife cut between son and father, daughter and mother, bride and mother-in-law. Cut through these cozy domestic arrangements and free you for God. Well-meaning family members can be your worst enemies. If you prefer father or mother over me, you don't deserve me. If you prefer son or daughter over me, you don't deserve me. If you don't go all the way with me, through thick and thin, you don't deserve me. If your first concern is to look after yourself, you'll never find yourself. But if you forget about yourself and look to me, you'll find both yourself and me. We are intimately linked in this harvest work. Anyone who accepts what you do accepts me, the one who sent you. Anyone who accepts what I do accepts my Father who sent me. Accepting a messenger of God is as good as being God's messenger. Accepting someone's help is as good as giving someone help. This is a large work I've called you into, but don't be overwhelmed by it. It's best to start small. Give a cool cup of water to someone who is thirsty, for instance. The smallest act of giving or receiving makes you a true apprentice. You won't lose out on a thing. John the Baptizer Chapter 11 When Jesus finished placing this charge before his twelve disciples, he went on to teach and preach in their villages. John, meanwhile, had been locked up in prison. When he got wind of what Jesus was doing, he sent his own disciples to ask, Are you the one we've been expecting, or are we still waiting? Jesus told them, Go back and tell John what's going on. The blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the wretched of the earth learn that God is on their side. Is this what you were expecting? Then count yourselves most blessed. When John's disciples left to report, Jesus started talking to the crowd about John. What did you expect when you went out to see him in the wild? A weekend camper? Hardly. What then? A sheik in silk pajamas? Not in the wilderness, not by a long shot. What then? A prophet? That's right, a prophet. Probably the best prophet you'll ever hear. He is the prophet that Malachi announced when he wrote, I'm sending my prophet ahead of you to make the road smooth for you. Let me tell you what's going on here. No one in history surpasses John the Baptizer, but in the kingdom he prepared for you, the lowliest person is ahead of him. For a long time now, people have tried to force themselves into God's kingdom. But if you read the books of the prophets and God's law closely, you will see them culminate in John, teaming up with him and preparing the way for the Messiah of the kingdom. Looked at in this way, John is the Elijah you've all been expecting to arrive and introduce the Messiah. Are you listening to me? Really listening? How can I account for this generation? The people have been like spoiled children whining to their parents. We wanted to skip rope and you were always too tired. We wanted to talk but you were always too busy. John came fasting and they called him crazy. I came feasting and they called me a lush, a friend of the riffraff. Opinion polls don't count for much, do they? The proof of the pudding is in the eating. The Unforced Rhythms of Grace Next, Jesus let fly in the cities where he had worked the hardest, but whose people had responded the least, shrugging their shoulders and going on their way. Doom to you, Chorazin. Doom, Bethsaida. If Tyre and Sidon had seen half of the powerful miracles you have seen, they would have been on their knees in a minute. At Judgment Day, they'll get off easy compared to you. And Capernaum, with all your peacock strutting, you're going to end up in the abyss. If the people of Sodom had had your chances, the city would still be around. At Judgment Day, they'll get off easy compared to you. Abruptly, Jesus broke into prayer. Thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. You've concealed your ways from sophisticates and know-it-alls, but spelled them out clearly to ordinary people. Yes, Father, that's the way you like to work. Jesus resumed talking to the people, but now tenderly. The Father has given me all these things to do and say. This is a unique father-son operation, coming out of father and son intimacies and knowledge. No one knows the son the way the father does, nor the father the way the son does. 
but I'm not keeping it to myself. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone willing to listen. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. In Charge of the Sabbath Chapter 12 One Sabbath, Jesus was strolling with his disciples through a field of ripe grain. Hungry, the disciples were pulling off the heads of grain and munching on them. Some Pharisees reported them to Jesus. Your disciples are breaking the Sabbath rules. Jesus said, Really? Didn't you ever read what David and his companions did when they were hungry? How they entered the sanctuary and ate fresh bread off the altar? Bread that no one but priests were allowed to eat? Didn't you ever read in God's law that priests carrying out their temple duties break Sabbath rules all the time and it's not held against them? There's far more at stake here than religion. If you had any idea what this scripture meant, I prefer a flexible heart to an inflexible ritual. You wouldn't be nitpicking like this. The Son of Man is no lackey to the Sabbath. He's in charge. When Jesus left the field, he entered their meeting place. There was a man there with a crippled hand. They said to Jesus, Is it legal to heal on the Sabbath? They were baiting him. He replied, Is there a person here who, finding one of your lambs fallen into a ravine, wouldn't, even though it was a Sabbath, pull it out? Surely kindness to people is as legal as kindness to animals. Then he said to the man, Hold out your hand. He held it out and it was healed. The Pharisees walked out furious, sputtering about how they were going to ruin Jesus. In charge of everything. Jesus, knowing they were out to get him, moved on. A lot of people followed him, and he healed them all. He also cautioned them to keep it quiet, following guidelines set down by Isaiah. Look well at my hand-picked servant. I love him so much. Take such delight in him. I've placed my spirit on him. He'll decree justice to the nations. But he won't yell, won't raise his voice. There'll be no commotion in the streets. He won't walk over anyone's feelings, won't push you into a corner. Before you know it, his justice will triumph. The mere sound of his name will signal hope, even among far-off unbelievers. No neutral ground. Next, a poor demon-afflicted wretch, both blind and deaf, was set down before him. Jesus healed him, gave him his sight and hearing. The people who saw it were impressed. This has to be the son of David. But the Pharisees, when they heard the report, were cynical. Black magic, they said. Some devil trick he's pulled from his sleeve. Jesus confronted their slander. A judge who gives opposite verdicts on the same person cancels himself out. A family that's in a constant squabble disintegrates. If Satan banishes Satan, is there any Satan left? If you're slinging devil mud at me, calling me a devil, kicking out devils, doesn't the same mud stick to your own exorcists? But if it's by God's power that I'm sending the evil spirits packing, then God's kingdom is here for sure. How in the world do you think it's possible, in broad daylight, to enter the house of an awake, able-bodied man and walk off with his possessions unless you tie him up first? Tie him up, though, and you can clean him out. This is war, and there is no neutral ground. If you're not on my side, you're the enemy. If you're not helping, you're making things worse. There's nothing done or said that can't be forgiven. But if you deliberately persist in your slanders against God's Spirit, you are repudiating the very one who forgives. If you reject the Son of Man out of some misunderstanding, the Holy Spirit can forgive you. But when you reject the Holy Spirit, you're sawing off the branch on which you're sitting, severing by your own perversity all connection with the one who forgives. If you grow a healthy tree, you'll pick healthy fruit. If you grow a diseased tree, you'll pick worm-eaten fruit. The fruit tells you about the tree. You have minds like a snake pit. How do you suppose what you say is worth anything when you are so foul-minded? It's your heart, not the dictionary that gives meaning to your words. A good person produces good deeds and words season after season. An evil person is a blight on the orchard. Let me tell you something. Every one of these careless words is going to come back to haunt you. 
There will be a time of reckoning. Words are powerful. Take them seriously. Words can be your salvation. Words can also be your damnation. Jonah Evidence Later, a few religion scholars and Pharisees got on him. Teacher, we want to see your credentials. Give us some hard evidence that God is in this. How about a miracle? Jesus said, You're looking for proof, but you're looking for the wrong kind. All you want is something to titillate your curiosity, satisfy your lust for miracles. The only proof you're going to get is what looks like the absence of proof. Jonah evidence. Like Jonah, three days and nights in the fish's belly, the Son of Man will be gone three days and nights in a deep grave. On Judgment Day, the Ninevites will stand up and give evidence that will condemn this generation because when Jonah preached to them, they changed their lives. A far greater preacher than Jonah is here, and you squabble about proofs. On Judgment Day, the Queen of Sheba will come forward and bring evidence that will condemn this generation because she traveled from a far corner of the earth to listen to wise Solomon. Wisdom far greater than Solomon's is right in front of you, and you quibble over evidence. When a defiling, evil spirit is expelled from someone, it drifts along through the desert, looking for an oasis, some unsuspecting soul it can be devil. When it doesn't find someone, it says, I'll go back to my old haunt. On return, it finds the person spotlessly clean, but vacant. It then runs out and rounds up seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they all move in, whooping it up. That person ends up far worse off than if he'd never gotten cleaned up in the first place. That's what this generation is like. You may think you have cleaned out the junk from your lives and gotten ready for God, but you weren't hospitable to my kingdom message. And now, all the devils are moving back in. Obedience is thicker than blood. While he was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers showed up. They were outside trying to get a message to him. Someone told Jesus, Your mother and brothers are out here, wanting to speak with you. Jesus didn't respond directly, but said, Who do you think my mother and brothers are? He then stretched out his hand toward his disciples. Look closely. These are my mother and brothers. Obedience is thicker than blood. The person who obeys my heavenly Father's will is my brother and sister and mother. A Harvest Story, Chapter 13 At about the same time, Jesus left the house and sat on the beach. In no time at all, a crowd gathered along the shoreline, forcing him to get into a boat. Using the boat as a pulpit, he addressed his congregation, telling stories. What do you make of this? A farmer planted seed. As he scattered the seed, some of it fell on the ground, and birds ate it. Some fell in the gravel. It sprouted quickly, but didn't put down roots. So when the sun came up, it withered just as quickly. Some fell in the weeds. As it came up, it was strangled by the weeds. Some fell on good earth, and it produced a harvest beyond his wildest dreams. Are you listening to this? Really listening? Why tell stories? The disciples came up and asked, Why do you tell stories? He replied, You've been given insight into God's kingdom. You know how it works. Not everybody has this gift, this insight. It hasn't been given to them. Whenever someone has a ready heart for this, the insights and understandings flow freely. But if there is no readiness, any trace of receptivity soon disappears. That's why I tell stories, to create readiness, to nudge the people toward receptive insight. In their present state, they can stare till doomsday and not see it, listen till they're blue in the face and not get it. I don't want Isaiah's forecast repeated all over again. Your ears are open, but you don't hear a thing. Your eyes are awake, but you don't see a thing. The people are blockheads. They stick their fingers in their ears so they won't have to listen. They screw their eyes shut so they won't have to look, so they won't have to deal with me face to face and let me heal them. But you have God-blessed eyes, eyes that see, and God-blessed ears, ears that hear. A lot of people, prophets and humble believers among them, would have given anything to see what you are seeing, to hear what you are hearing, but never had the chance. The Meaning of the Harvest Story Study this story of the farmer planting seed. When anyone hears news of the kingdom and doesn't take it in, it just remains on the surface, and so the evil one comes along and plucks it right out of that person's heart. 
This is the seed the farmer scatters on the road. The seed cast in the gravel? This is the person who hears and instantly responds with enthusiasm. But there's no soil of character, and so when the emotions wear off and some difficulty arrives, there's nothing to show for it. The seed cast in the weeds is the person who hears the kingdom news, but weeds of worry and illusions about getting more and wanting everything under the sun strangle what was heard, and nothing comes of it. The seed cast on good earth is the person who hears and takes in the news, and then produces a harvest beyond his wildest dreams. He told another story. God's kingdom is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. That night, while his hired men were asleep, his enemy sowed thistles all through the wheat and slipped away before dawn. When the first green shoots appeared and the grain began to form, the thistles showed up too. The farmhands came to the farmer and said, Master, that was clean seed you planted, wasn't it? Where did these thistles come from? He answered, Some enemy did this. The farmhands asked, Should we weed out the thistles? He said, No, if you weed the thistles, you'll pull up the wheat too. Let them grow together until harvest time. Then I'll instruct the harvesters to pull up the thistles and tie them in bundles for the fire, then gather the wheat and put it in the barn. Another story. God's kingdom is like a pine nut that a farmer plants. It is quite small as seeds go, but in the course of years it grows into a huge pine tree, and eagles build nests in it. Another story. God's kingdom is like yeast that a woman works into the dough for dozens of loaves of barley bread and waits while the dough rises. All Jesus did that day was tell stories, a long storytelling afternoon. His storytelling fulfilled the prophecy. I will open my mouth and tell stories. I will bring out into the open things hidden since the world's first day. The Curtain of History Jesus dismissed the congregation and went into the house. His disciples came in and said, Explain to us that story of the thistles in the field. So he explained. The farmer who sows the pure seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The pure seeds are subjects of the kingdom. The thistles are subjects of the devil. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. The curtain of history. The harvest hands are angels. The picture of thistles pulled up and burned is a scene from the final act. The Son of Man will send his angels, weed out the thistles from his kingdom, pitch them in the trash, and be done with them. They are going to complain to high heaven, but nobody is going to listen. At the same time, ripe, holy lives will mature and adorn the kingdom of their Father. Are you listening to this? Really listening? God's kingdom is like a treasure hidden in a field for years and then accidentally found by a trespasser. The finder is ecstatic, what a find, and proceeds to sell everything he owns to raise money and buy that field. Or, God's kingdom is like a jewel merchant on the hunt for excellent pearls. Finding one that is flawless, he immediately sells everything and buys it. Or, God's kingdom is like a fishnet cast into the sea, catching all kinds of fish. When it is full, it is hauled onto the beach. The good fish are picked out and put in a tub. Those unfit to eat are thrown away. That's how it will be when the curtain comes down on history. The angels will come and cull the bad fish and throw them in the garbage. There will be a lot of desperate complaining, but it won't do any good. Jesus asked, Are you starting to get a handle on all of this? They answered, Yes. He said, Then you see how every student well-trained in God's kingdom is like the owner of a general store who can put his hands on anything you need, old or new, exactly when you need it. When Jesus finished telling these stories, he left there, returned to his hometown, and gave a lecture in the meeting house. He made a real hit, impressing everyone. We had no idea he was this good, they said. How did he get so wise, get such ability? But in the next breath, they were cutting him down. We've known him since he was a kid. He's the carpenter's son. We know his mother, Mary. We know his brothers, James and Joseph, Simon and Judas. All his sisters live here. Who does he think he is? They got their noses all out of joint. But Jesus said, A prophet is taken for granted in his hometown and his family. He didn't do many miracles there because of their hostile indifference. The Death of John Chapter 14 
At about this time, Herod, the regional ruler, heard what was being said about Jesus. He said to his servants, This has to be John the baptizer come back from the dead. That's why he's able to work miracles. Herod had arrested John, put him in chains, and sent him to prison to placate Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. John had provoked Herod by naming his relationship with Herodias adultery. Herod wanted to kill him, but he was afraid because so many people revered John as a prophet of God. But at his birthday celebration, he got his chance. Herodias' daughter provided the entertainment, dancing for the guests. She swept Herod away. In his drunken enthusiasm, he promised her an oath, anything she wanted. Already coached by her mother, she was ready. Give me, served up on a platter, the head of John the Baptizer. That sobered the king up fast. Unwilling to lose face with his guests, he did it, ordered John's head cut off and presented to the girl on a platter. She, in turn, gave it to her mother. Later, John's disciples got the body, gave it a reverent burial, and reported to Jesus. Supper for 5,000 When Jesus got the news, he slipped away by boat to an out-of-the-way place by himself. But unsuccessfully, someone saw him and the word got around. Soon, a lot of people from the nearby villages walked around the lake to where he was. When he saw them coming, he was overcome with pity and healed their sick. Toward evening, the disciples approached him. We're out in the country and it's getting late. Dismiss the people so they can go to the villages and get some supper. But Jesus said, There is no need to dismiss them. You give them supper. All we have are five loaves of bread and two fish, they said. Jesus said, Bring them here. Then he had the people sit on the grass. He took the five loaves and two fish, lifted his face to heaven in prayer, blessed, broke, and gave the bread to the disciples. The disciples then gave the food to the congregation. They all ate their fill. They gathered twelve baskets of leftovers. About five thousand were fed. Walking on the water As soon as the meal was finished, He insisted that the disciples get in the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the people. With the crowd dispersed, he climbed the mountain so he could be by himself and pray. He stayed there alone late into the night. Meanwhile, the boat was far out to sea when the wind came up against them and they were battered by the waves. At about four o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. They were scared out of their wits. A A ghost, they said, crying out in terror. But Jesus was quick to comfort them. Courage, it's me. Don't be afraid. Peter, suddenly bold, said, Master, if it's really you, call me to come to you on the water. He said, Come ahead. Jumping out of the boat, Peter walked on the water to Jesus. But when he looked down at the waves churning beneath his feet, he lost his nerve and started to sink. He cried, Master, save me. Jesus didn't hesitate. He reached down and grabbed his hand. Then he said, Faint heart, what got into you? The two of them climbed into the boat, and the wind died down. The disciples in the boat, having watched the whole thing, worshipped Jesus, saying, This is it. You are God's son for sure. On return, they beached the boat at Gennesaret. When the people got wind that he was back, they sent out word through the neighborhood and rounded up all the sick, who asked for permission to touch the edge of this coat, and whoever touched him was healed. What pollutes your life? Chapter 15 After that, Pharisees and religion scholars came to Jesus all the way from Jerusalem, criticizing, Why do your disciples play fast and loose with the rules? But Jesus put it right back on them. Why do you use your rules to play fast and loose with God's commands? God clearly says, Respect your father and mother, and anyone denouncing father or mother should be killed. But you weasel around that by saying, Whoever wants to can say to father and mother, What I owed to you, I've given to God. That can hardly be called respecting a parent. You cancel God's command by your rules. Frauds. Isaiah's prophecy of you hit the bullseye. These people make a big show of saying the right thing, but their heart isn't in it. They act like they're worshipping me, but they don't mean it. They just use me as a cover for teaching whatever suits their fancy. He then called the crowd together and said, Listen, and take this to heart. It's not what you swallow that pollutes your life, but what you vomit up. Later, his disciples came and told him, Did you know how upset the Pharisees were when they heard what you said? 
Jesus shrugged it off. Every tree that wasn't planted by my Father in heaven will be pulled up by its roots. Forget them. They are blind men leading blind men. When a blind man leads a blind man, they both end up in the ditch. Peter said, I don't get it. Put it in plain language. Jesus replied, You too? Are you being willfully stupid? Don't you know that anything that is swallowed works its way through the intestines and is finally defecated? But what comes out of the mouth gets its start in the heart. It's from the heart that we vomit up evil arguments, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, lies, and cussing. That's what pollutes. Eating or not eating certain foods, washing or not washing your hands, that's neither here nor there. Healing the People From there, Jesus took a trip to Tyre and Sidon. They had hardly arrived when a Canaanite woman came down from the hills and pleaded, Mercy, Master, Son of David, my daughter is cruelly afflicted by an evil spirit. Jesus ignored her. The disciples came and complained, Now she's bothering us. Would you please take care of her? She's driving us crazy. Jesus refused, telling them, I've got my hands full dealing with the lost sheep of Israel. Then the woman came back to Jesus, went to her knees and begged, Master, help me. He said, It's not right to take bread out of children's mouths and throw it to dogs. She was quick. You're right, Master, but beggar dogs do get scraps from the Master's table. Jesus gave in. Oh, woman, your faith is something else. What you want is what you get. Right then, her daughter became well. After Jesus returned, he walked along Lake Galilee and then climbed a mountain and took his place, ready to receive visitors. They came, tons of them, bringing along the paraplegic, the blind, the maimed, the mute, all sorts of people in need, and more or less threw them down at Jesus' feet to see what he would do with them. He healed them. When the people saw the mute speaking, the maimed healthy, the paraplegics walking around, the blind looking around, they were astonished and let everyone know that God was blazingly alive among them. But Jesus wasn't finished with them. He called his disciples and said, I hurt for these people. For three days now they've been with me and and now they have nothing to eat. I can't send them away without a meal. They'd probably collapse on the road. His disciples said, But where in this deserted place are you going to dig up enough food for a meal? Jesus asked, How much bread do you have? Seven loaves, they said, plus a few fish. At that, Jesus directed the people to sit down. He took the seven loaves and the fish. After giving thanks, he divided it up and gave it to the people. Everyone ate. They had all they wanted. It took seven large baskets to collect the leftovers. Over 4,000 people ate their fill at that meal. After Jesus sent them away, he climbed in the boat and crossed over to the Magadan Hills. Some Bad Yeast Chapter 16 Some Pharisees and Sadducees were on him again, pressing him to prove himself to them. He told them, You have a saying that goes, Red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky at morning, sailors take warning. You find it easy enough to forecast the weather. Why can't you read the signs of the times? An evil and wanton generation is always wanting signs and wonders. The only sign you'll get is the Jonah sign. Then he turned on his heel and walked away. On their way to the other side of the lake, the disciples discovered they had forgotten to bring along bread. In the meantime, Jesus said to them, Keep a sharp eye out for Pharisee, Sadducee, yeast. Thinking he was scolding them for forgetting bread, they discussed in whispers what to do. Jesus knew what they were doing and said, Why all these worried whispers about forgetting the bread? Runt believers, haven't you caught on yet? Don't you remember the five loaves of bread and the five thousand people and how many baskets of fragments you picked up? Or the seven loaves that fed four thousand and how many baskets of leftovers you collected? Haven't you realized yet that bread isn't the problem? The problem is yeast, Pharisee-Sadducee yeast. Then they got it, that he wasn't concerned about eating, but teaching, the Pharisee-Sadducee kind of teaching. Son of Man, Son of God When Jesus arrived in the villages of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, What are people saying about who the Son of Man is? They replied, Some think he is John the Baptizer, some say Elijah, some Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. He pressed them, And how about you? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter said, You're the Christ, 
the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus came back. God bless you, Simon, son of Jonah. You didn't get that answer out of books or from teachers. My father in heaven, God himself, let you in on this secret of who I really am. And now I'm going to tell you who you are, really are. You are Peter, a rock. This is the rock on which I will put together my church, a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. And that's not all. You will have complete and free access to God's kingdom, keys to open any and every door. No more barriers between heaven and earth, earth and heaven. A yes on earth is yes in heaven. A no on earth is no in heaven. He swore the disciples to secrecy. He made them promise they would tell no one that he was the Messiah. You are not in the driver's seat. Then Jesus made it clear to his disciples that it was now necessary for him to go to Jerusalem, submit to an ordeal of suffering at the hands of the religious leaders, be killed, and then on the third day be raised up alive. Peter took him in hand, protesting, Impossible, Master, that can never be. But Jesus didn't swerve. Peter, get out of my way. Satan, get lost. You have no idea how God works. Then Jesus went to work on his disciples. Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to finding yourself, your true self. What kind of deal is it to get everything you want but lose yourself? What could you ever trade your soul for? Don't be in such a hurry to go into business for yourself. Before you know it, the Son of Man will arrive with all the splendor of his Father, accompanied by an army of angels. You'll get everything you have coming to you, a personal gift. This isn't pie in the sky by and by. Some of you standing here are going to see it take place. See the Son of Man in kingdom glory. Sunlight poured from his face. Chapter 17 Six days later, three of them saw that glory. Jesus took Peter and the brothers, James and John, and led them up a high mountain. His appearance changed from the inside out, right before their eyes. Sunlight poured from his face. His clothes were filled with light. Then they realized that Moses and Elijah were also there in deep conversation with him. Peter broke in. Master, this is a great moment. What would you think if I built three memorials here on the mountain? One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While he was going on like this, babbling, a light radiant cloud enveloped them, and sounding from deep in the cloud, a voice. This is my son, marked by my love, focus of my delight. Listen to him. When the disciples heard it, they fell flat on their faces, scared to death. But Jesus came over and touched them. Don't be afraid. When they opened their eyes and looked around, all they saw was Jesus. Only Jesus. Coming down the mountain, Jesus swore them to secrecy. Don't breathe a word of what you've seen. After the Son of Man is raised from the dead, you are free to talk. The disciples, meanwhile, were asking questions. Why did the religion scholars say that Elijah has to come first? Jesus answered, Elijah does come first and get everything ready. I'm telling you, Elijah has already come, but they didn't know him when they saw him. They treated him like dirt, the same way that they are about to treat the Son of Man. That's when the disciples realized that all along he had been talking about John, the baptizer. With a mere kernel of faith. At the bottom of the mountain, they were met by a crowd of waiting people. As they approached, a man came out of the crowd and fell to his knees, begging, Master, have mercy on my son. He goes out of his mind and suffers terribly, falling into seizures. Frequently, he is pitched into the fire, other times into the river. I brought him to your disciples, but they could do nothing for him. Jesus said, What a generation. No sense of God. No focus to your lives. How many times do I have to go over these things? How much longer do I have to put up with this? Bring the boy here. He ordered the afflicting demon out, and it was out, gone. From that moment on, the boy was well. When the disciples had Jesus off to themselves, they asked, Why couldn't we throw it out? Because you're not taking God seriously, said Jesus. The simple truth is that if you had a mere kernel of faith, a poppy seed, say, you would tell this mountain, move, and it would move. There's nothing you wouldn't be able to tackle. As they were regrouping in Galilee, Jesus told them, 
The Son of Man is about to be betrayed by some people who want nothing to do with God. They will murder him, and three days later he will be raised alive. The disciples felt terrible. When they arrived at Capernaum, the tax men came to Peter and asked, Does your teacher pay taxes? Peter said, Of course. But as soon as they were in the house, Jesus confronted him. Simon, what do you think? When a king levies taxes, who pays? His children or his subjects? He answered, his subjects? Jesus said, then the children get off free, right? But so we don't upset them needlessly, go down to the lake, cast a hook, and pull in the first fish that bites. Open its mouth, and you'll find a coin. Take it and give it to the tax men. It will be enough for both of us. Whoever becomes simple again. Chapter 18. At about the same time, the disciples came to Jesus, asking, Who gets the highest rank in God's kingdom? For an answer, Jesus called over a child, whom he stood in the middle of the room and said, I'm telling you once and for all that unless you return to square one and start over like children, you're not even going to get a look at the kingdom, let alone get in. Whoever becomes simple and elemental again, like this child, will rank high in God's kingdom. What's more, when you receive the child like on my account, it's the same as receiving me. But if you give them a hard time bullying or taking advantage of their simple trust, you'll soon wish you hadn't. You'd be better off dropped in the middle of the lake with a millstone around your neck, doomed to the world for giving these God-believing children a hard time. Hard times are inevitable, but you don't have to make it worse, and it's doomsday to you if you do. If your hand or your foot gets in the way of God, chop it off and throw it away. You're better off maimed or lame and alive than the proud owners of two hands and two feet godless in a furnace of eternal fire. And if your eye distracts you from God, pull it out and throw it away. You're better off one-eyed and alive than exercising your 20-20 vision from inside the fire of hell. Watch that you don't treat a single one of these childlike believers arrogantly. You realize, don't you, that their personal angels are constantly in touch with my Father in heaven. Work it out between you. Look at it this way. If someone has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders off, doesn't he leave the ninety-nine and go after the one? And if he finds it, doesn't he make far more over it than over the ninety-nine who stay put? Your Father in Heaven feels the same way. He doesn't want to lose even one of these simple believers. If a fellow believer hurts you, go and tell him. Work it out between the two of you. If he listens, you've made a friend. If you won't listen, take one or two others along so that the presence of witnesses will keep things honest and try again. If he still won't listen, tell the church. If he won't listen to the church, you'll have to start over from scratch, confront him with the need for repentance, and offer again God's forgiving love. Take this most seriously. A yes on earth is yes in heaven. A no on earth is no in heaven. What you say to one another is eternal. I mean this. When two of you get together on anything at all on earth and make a prayer of it, my Father in heaven goes into action. And when two or three of you are together because of me, you can be sure that I'll be there. A story about forgiveness. At that point, Peter got up the nerve to ask, Master, how many times do I forgive a brother or sister who hurts me? Seven? Jesus replied, Seven? Hardly. Try seventy times seven. The kingdom of God is like a king who decided to square accounts with his servants. As he got underway, one servant was brought before him who had run up a debt of a hundred thousand dollars. He couldn't pay up, so the king ordered the man, along with his wife, children, and goods, to be auctioned off at the slave market. The poor wretch threw himself at the king's feet and begged, Give me a chance and I'll pay it all back. Touched by his plea, the king let him off, erasing the debt. The servant was no sooner out of the room when he came upon one of his fellow servants who owed him ten dollars. He seized him by the throat and demanded, Pay up, now! The poor wretch threw himself down and begged, Give me a chance and I'll pay it all back. He wouldn't do it. He had him arrested and put in jail until the debt was paid. When the other servants saw this going on, they were outraged and brought a detailed report to the king. The king summoned the man and said, You evil servant! I forgave your entire debt when you begged me for mercy. Shouldn't you be compelled to be merciful to your fellow servant who asked for mercy? The king was furious and put the screws to the man until he paid back his entire debt. 
And that's exactly what my Father in Heaven is going to do to each one of you who doesn't forgive unconditionally anyone who asks for mercy. Divorce, chapter 19. When Jesus had completed these teachings, he left Galilee and crossed the region of Judea on the other side of the Jordan. Great crowds followed him there, and he healed them. One day, the Pharisees were badgering him. Is it legal for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? He answered, Haven't you read in your Bible that the Creator originally made man and woman for each other, male and female? And because of this, a man leaves father and mother and is firmly bonded to his wife, becoming one flesh, no longer two bodies, but one. Because God created this organic union of the two sexes, no one should desecrate his art by cutting them apart. They shot back in rebuttal. If that's so, why did Moses give instructions for divorce papers and divorce procedures? Jesus said, Moses provided for divorce as a concession to your hard-heartedness, but it is not part of God's original plan. I'm holding you to the original plan and holding you liable for adultery if you divorced your faithful wife and then marry someone else. I make an exception in cases where the spouse has committed adultery. Jesus' disciples objected. If those are the terms of marriage, we're stuck. Why get married? But Jesus said, Not everyone is mature enough to live a married life. It requires a certain aptitude and grace. Marriage isn't for everyone. Some, from birth seemingly, never give marriage a thought. Others never get asked or accepted. And some decide not to get married for kingdom reasons. But if you're capable of growing into the largeness of marriage, do it. To enter God's kingdom. One day, children were brought to Jesus in the hope that he would lay hands on them and pray over them. The disciples shooed them off, but Jesus intervened. Let the children alone. Don't prevent them from coming to me. God's kingdom is made up of people like these. After laying hands on them, he left. Another day, a man stopped Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Jesus said, Why do you question me about what's good? God is the one who is good. If you want to enter the life of God, just do what he tells you. The man asked, what in particular? Jesus said, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as you do yourself. The young man said, I've done all that. What's left? If you want to give it all you've got, Jesus replied, go sell your possessions, give everything to the poor. All your wealth will then be in heaven. Then, come follow me. That was the last thing the young man expected to hear. And so, crestfallen, he walked away. He was holding on tight to a lot of things, and he couldn't bear to let go. As he watched him go, Jesus told his disciples, Do you have any idea how difficult it is for the rich to enter God's kingdom? Let me tell you, it's easier to gallop a camel through a needle's eye than for the rich to enter God's kingdom. The disciples were staggered then who has any chance at all? Jesus looked hard at them and said, No chance at all if you think you can pull it off yourself. Every chance in the world if you trust God to do it. Then Peter chimed in, We left everything and followed you. What do we get for it? Jesus replied, Yes, you have followed me. In the recreation of the world, when the Son of Man will rule gloriously, you who have followed me will also rule, starting with the twelve tribes of Israel. And not only you, but anyone who sacrifices home, family, fields, whatever, because of me, will get it all back a hundred times over, not to mention the considerable bonus of eternal life. This is the great reversal, many of the first ending up last, and the last first. A Story About Workers Chapter 20 God's kingdom is like an estate manager who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. They agreed on a wage of a dollar a day and went to work. Later, about nine o'clock, the manager saw some other men hanging around the town square unemployed. He told them to go to work in his vineyard and he would pay them a fair wage. They went. He did the same thing at noon and again at three o'clock. At five o'clock, he went back and found still others standing around. He said, Why are you standing around all day doing nothing? They said, because no one hired us. He told them to go to work in his vineyard. When the day's work was over, the owner of the vineyard instructed his foreman, call the workers in and pay them their wages. Start with the last hired and go on to the first. 
Those hired at five o'clock came up and were each given a dollar. When those who were hired first saw that, they assumed they would get far more. But they got the same, each of them one dollar. Taking the dollar, they groused angrily to the manager. These last workers put in only one easy hour, and you just made them equal to us, who slaved all day under a scorching sun. He replied to the one speaking for the rest, Friend, I haven't been unfair. We agreed on the wage of a dollar, didn't we? So take it and go. I decided to give to the one who came last the same as you. Can't I do what I want with my own money? Are you going to get stingy because I am generous? Here it is again, the great reversal. Many of the first ending up last, and the last first. To drink from the cup. Jesus, now well on the way up to Jerusalem, took the twelve off to the side of the road and said, Listen to me carefully. We are on our way up to Jerusalem. When we get there, the Son of Man will be betrayed to the religious leaders and scholars. They will sentence him to death. They will then hand him over to the Romans for mockery and torture and crucifixion. On the third day, he will be raised up alive. It was about that time that the mother of the Zebedee brothers came with her two sons and knelt before Jesus with a request. What do you want? Jesus asked. She said, Give your word that these two sons of mine will be awarded the highest places of honor in your kingdom, one at your right hand, one at your left hand. Jesus responded, You have no idea what you're asking. And he said to James and John, are you capable of drinking the cup that I'm about to drink? They said, sure, why not? Jesus said, come to think of it, you are going to drink my cup. But as to awarding places of honor, that's not my business. My father is taking care of that. When the ten others heard about this, they lost their tempers, thoroughly disgusted with the two brothers. So Jesus got them together to settle things down. He said, You've observed how godless rulers throw their weight around, how quickly a little power goes to their heads. It's not going to be that way with you. Whoever wants to be great must become a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. That is what the Son of Man has done. He came to serve, not be served, and then to give away his life in exchange for the many who are held hostage. As they were leaving Jericho, a huge crowd followed. Suddenly, they came upon two blind men sitting alongside the road. When they heard it was Jesus passing, they cried out, Master, have mercy on us, mercy, son of David. The crowd tried to hush them up, but they got all the louder, crying, Master, have mercy on us, mercy, son of David. Jesus stopped and called over, What do you want from me? They said, Master, we want our eyes open, we want to see. Deeply moved, Jesus touched their eyes. They had their sight back that very instant and joined the procession. The Royal Welcome Chapter 21 When they neared Jerusalem, having arrived at Bethphage on Mount Olives, Jesus sent two disciples with these instructions. Go over to the village across from you. You'll find a donkey tethered there, her colt with her. Untie her and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you're doing, say, the master needs them. He will send them with you. This is the full story of what was sketched earlier by the prophet. Tell Zion's daughter, Look, your king is on his way, poised and ready, mounted on a donkey, on a colt, full of a pack animal. The disciples went and did exactly what Jesus told them to do. They led the donkey and colt out, laid some of their clothes on them, and Jesus mounted. Nearly all the people in the crowd threw their garments down on the road, giving him a royal welcome. Others cut branches from the trees and threw them down as a welcome mat. Crowds went ahead and crowds followed, all of them calling out, Hosanna to David's son, blessed is he who comes in God's name. Hosanna in highest heaven. As he made his entrance into Jerusalem, the whole city was shaken. Unnerved, people were asking, what's going on here? Who is this? The parade crowd answered, this is the prophet Jesus, the one from Nazareth in Galilee. He kicked over the tables. Jesus went straight to the temple and threw out everyone who had set up shop buying and selling. He kicked over the tables of loan sharks and the stalls of dove merchants. He quoted this text, My house was designated a house of prayer. You have made it a hangout for thieves. Now there was room for the blind and crippled to get in. They came to Jesus and he healed them. 
When the religious leaders saw the outrageous things he was doing and heard all the children running and shouting through the temple, Hosanna to David's son, they were up in arms and took him to task. Do do you hear what these children are saying? Jesus said, Yes, I hear them. And haven't you read in God's word, from the mouths of children and babies, I'll furnish a place of praise? Fed up, Jesus turned on his heel and left the city for Bethany, where he spent the night. The Withered Fig Tree Early the next morning, Jesus was returning to the city. He was hungry. Seeing a lone fig tree alongside the road, he approached it, anticipating a breakfast of figs. When he got to the tree, there was nothing but fig leaves. He said, No more figs from this tree, ever. The fig tree withered on the spot, a dry stick. The disciples saw it happen. They rubbed their eyes, saying, Do we really see this? A leafy tree one minute, a dry stick the next? But Jesus was matter of fact. Yes, and if you embrace this kingdom life and don't doubt God, you'll not only do minor feats like I did to the fig tree, but also triumph over huge obstacles. This mountain, for instance, you'll tell, Go, jump in the lake and it will jump. Absolutely everything, ranging from small to large, as you make it a part of your believing prayer, gets included as you lay hold of God. True Authority Then he was back in the temple, teaching. The high priests and leaders of the people came up and demanded, Show us your credentials. Who authorized you to teach here? Jesus responded, First, let me ask you a question. You answer my question, then I'll answer yours. About the baptism of John, who authorized it, heaven or humans? They were on the spot and knew it. They pulled back into a huddle and whispered, If we say heaven, he'll ask us why we didn't believe him. If we say humans, we're up against it with the people because they all hold John up as a prophet. They decided to concede that round to Jesus. We don't know, they answered. Jesus said, Then neither will I answer your question. The story of two sons. Tell me what you think of this story. A man had two sons. He went up to the first and said, Son, go out for the day and work in the vineyard. The son answered, I don't want to. Later on, he thought better of it and went. The father gave the same command to the second son. He answered, Sure, glad to. But he never went. Which of the two sons did what the father asked? They said, The first. Jesus said, Yes. And I tell you that crooks and whores are going to precede you into God's kingdom. John came to you showing you the right road. You turned up your noses at him, but the crooks and whores believed him. Even when you saw their changed lives, you didn't care enough to change and believe him. The story of the greedy farmhands. Here's another story. Listen closely. There was once a man, a wealthy farmer, who planted a vineyard. He fenced it dug a wine press, put up a watchtower, then turned it over to the farmhands and went off on a trip. When it was time to harvest the grapes, he sent his servants back to collect his profits. The farmhands grabbed the first servant and beat him up. The next one they murdered. They threw stones at the third, but he got away. The owner tried again, sending more servants. They got the same treatment. The owner was at the end of his rope. He decided to send his son. Surely he thought they will respect my son. But when the farmhands saw the sun arrive, they rubbed their hands in greed. This is the heir. Let's kill him and have it all for ourselves. They grabbed him, threw him out, and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard arrives home from his trip, what do you think he'll do to the farmhands? He'll kill them. A rotten bunch and good riddance, they answered. Then he'll assign the vineyard to farmhands who will hand over the profits when it's time. Jesus said, Right and you could read it for yourselves in your Bibles. The stone the Masons threw out is now the cornerstone. This is God's work. We rub our eyes. We can hardly believe it. This is the way it is with you. God's kingdom will be taken back from you and handed over to a people who will live out a kingdom life. Whoever stumbles on this stone gets shattered. Whoever the stone falls on gets smashed. When the religious leaders heard this story, they knew it was aimed at them. They wanted to arrest Jesus and put him in jail, but, intimidated by public opinion, they held back. Most people held him to be a prophet of God. The Story of the Wedding Banquet, Chapter 22 Jesus responded by telling still more stories. 
God's kingdom, he said, is like a king who threw a wedding banquet for his son. He sent out servants to call in all the invited guests, and they wouldn't come. He sent out another round of servants, instructing them to tell the guests, Look, everything is on the table. The prime rib is ready for carving. Come to the feast. They only shrugged their shoulders and went off, one to weed his garden, another to work in his shop, with nothing better to do, beat up on the messengers, and then killed them. The king was outraged and sent his soldiers to destroy those thugs and level their city. Then he told his servants, We have a wedding banquet all prepared, but no guests. The ones I invited weren't up to it. Go out into the busiest intersections in town and invite anyone you find to the banquet. The servants went out on the streets and rounded up everyone they laid eyes on, good and bad regardless. And so the banquet was on, every place filled. When the king entered and looked over the scene, he spotted a man who wasn't properly dressed. He said to him, Friend, how dare you come in here looking like that? The man was speechless. Then the king told his servants, Get him out of here, fast. Tie him up and ship him to hell, and make sure he doesn't get back in. That's what I mean when I say, Many get invited, only a few make it. Paying Taxes that's when the Pharisees plotted a way to trap him into saying something damaging. They sent their disciples, with a few of Herod's followers mixed in, to ask, Teacher, we know you have integrity, teach the way of God accurately, are indifferent to popular opinion, and don't pander to your students. So tell us honestly, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Jesus knew they were up to no good. He said, Why are you playing these games with me? Why are you trying to trap me? Do you have a coin? Let me see it. They handed him a silver piece. This engraving, who does it look like, and whose name is on it? And they said, Caesar. Then give Caesar what is his, and give God what is his. The Pharisees were speechless. They went off shaking their heads. Marriage and Resurrection That same day, Sadducees approached him. This is the party that denies any possibility of resurrection. They asked, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies childless, his brother is obligated to marry his widow and get her with child. Here's a case where there were seven brothers. The first brother married and died, leaving no child, and his wife passed to his brother. The second brother also left her childless. Then the third, and on and on, all seven. Eventually, the wife died. Now, here's our question. At the resurrection, whose wife is she? She was a wife to each of them. Jesus answered, You're off base on two counts. You don't know your Bibles and you don't know how God works. At the resurrection, we're beyond marriage. As with the angels, all our ecstasies and intimacies then will be with God. And regarding your speculation on whether the dead are raised or not, don't you read your Bibles? The grammar is clear. God says, I am, not was, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. The living God defines himself not as the God of dead men, but of the living. Hearing this exchange, the crowd was much impressed. The Most Important Command When the Pharisees heard how he had bested the Sadducees, they gathered their forces for an assault. One of their religion scholars spoke for them, posing a question they hoped would show him up. Teacher, which command in God's law is the most important? Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence. This is the most important the first on any list, but there is a second to set alongside it. Love others as well as you love yourself. These two commands are pegs. Everything in God's law and the prophets hangs from them. David's Son and Master As the Pharisees were regrouping, Jesus caught them off balance with his own test question. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said, David's son. Jesus replied, Well, if the Christ is David's son, how do you explain that David, under inspiration, named Christ his master? God said to my master, sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, if David calls him master, how can he at the same time be his son? That stumped them, literalists that they were. Unwilling to risk losing face again in one of these public verbal exchanges, they quit asking questions for good. Religious Fashion Shows, Chapter 23 Now Jesus turned to address his disciples, along with the crowd that had gathered with them. 
The religion scholars and Pharisees are competent teachers in God's law. You won't go wrong in following their teachings on Moses. But be careful about following them. They talk a good line, but they don't live it. They don't take it into their hearts and live it out in their behavior. It's all spit and polish veneer. Instead of giving you God's law as food and drink by which you can banquet on God, they package it in bundles of rules, loading you down like pack animals. They seem to take pleasure in watching you stagger under these loads and wouldn't think of lifting a finger to help. Their lives are perpetual fashion shows, embroidered prayer shawls one day and flowery prayers the next. They love to sit at the head table at church dinners, basking in the most prominent positions, preening in the radiance of public flattery, receiving honorary degrees and getting called doctor and reverend. Don't let people do that to you. Put you on a pedestal like that. You all have a single teacher and you are all classmates. Don't set people up as experts over your life, letting them tell you what to do. Save that authority for God. Let him tell you what to do. No one else should carry the title of father. You have only one father, and he's in heaven. And don't let people maneuver you into taking charge of them. There is only one life leader for you and them. Christ. Do you want to stand out? Then step down. Be a servant. If you puff yourself up, you'll get the wind knocked out of you. But if you're content to simply be yourself, your life will count for plenty. Frauds. I've had it with you. You're hopeless, you religion scholars, you Pharisees. Frauds. Your lives are roadblocks to God's kingdom. You refuse to enter and won't let anyone else in either. You're hopeless, you religion scholars and Pharisees. Frauds. You go halfway around the world to make a convert, but once you get him, you make him into a replica of yourselves. Double damned. You're hopeless. What arrogant stupidity. You say, if someone makes a promise with his fingers crossed, that's nothing. But if he swears with his hand on the Bible, that's serious? What ignorance! Does the leather on the Bible carry more weight than the skin on your hands? And what about this piece of trivia? If you shake hands on a promise, that's nothing. But if you raise your hand that God is your witness, that's serious? What ridiculous hair splitting! What difference does it make whether you shake hands or raise hands? A promise is a promise. What difference does it make if you make your promise inside or outside a house of worship? A promise is a promise. God is present, watching and holding you to account regardless. You're hopeless, you religion scholars and Pharisees. Frauds. You keep meticulous account books, tithing on every nickel and dime you get, but on the meat of God's law, things like fairness and compassion and commitment, the absolute basics, you carelessly take it or leave it. Careful bookkeeping is commendable, but the basics are required. Do you have any idea how silly you look, writing a life story that's wrong from start to finish, nitpicking over commas and semicolons? You're hopeless, you religion scholars and Pharisees, frauds. You burnish the surface of your cups and bowls so they sparkle in the sun, while the insides are maggoty with your greed and gluttony. Stupid Pharisee, scour the insides, and then the gleaming surface will mean something. You're hopeless, you religion scholars and Pharisees. Frauds, you're like manicured grave plots. Grass clipped and the flowers bright, but six feet down, it's all rotting bones and worm-eaten flesh. People look at you and think you're saints, but beneath the skin, you're total frauds. You're hopeless, you religion scholars and Pharisees. Frauds! You build granite tombs for your prophets and marble monuments for your saints. And you say that if you had lived in the days of your ancestors, no blood would have been on your hands. You protest too much. You're cut from the same cloth as those murderers and daily add to the death count. Snakes! Reptilian sneaks! Do you think you can worm your way out of this? Never have to pay the piper? It's on account of people like you that I send prophets and wise guides and scholars generation after generation. And generation after generation, you treat them like dirt, greeting them with lynch mobs, hounding them with abuse. You can't squirm out of this. Every drop of righteous blood ever spilled on this earth, beginning with the blood of that good man Abel, right down to the blood of Zechariah, Berechiah's son, whom you murdered at his prayers, is on your head. All this, I'm telling you, is coming down on you, on your generation. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, murderer of prophets, killer of the ones who brought you God's news. How often I ache to embrace your children, the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. You wouldn't let me. And now you're so desolate, nothing but 
A ghost town. What is there left to say? Only this. I'm out of here soon. The next time you'll see me, you'll say, Oh, God has blessed him. He's come, bringing God's rule. Routine History, Chapter 24 Jesus then left the temple. As he walked away, his disciples pointed out how very impressive the temple architecture was. Jesus said, You're not impressed by all this sheer size, are you? The truth of the matter is that there's not a stone in that building that is not going to end up in a pile of rubble. Later, as he was sitting on Mount Olives, his disciples approached and asked him, Tell us, when are these things going to happen? What will be the sign of your coming, that the time's up? Jesus said, Watch out for doomsday deceivers. Many leaders are going to show up with forged identities claiming, I am Christ, the Messiah. They will deceive a lot of people. When reports come in of wars and rumored wars, keep your head and don't panic. This is routine history. This is no sign of the end. Nation will fight nation and ruler fight ruler over and over. Famines and earthquakes will occur in various places. This is nothing compared to what is coming. They are going to throw you out to the wolves and kill you. Everyone hating you because you carry my name. And then, going from bad to worse, it will be dog eat dog. Everyone at each other's throat. Everyone hating each other. In the confusion, lying creatures will come forward and deceive a lot of people. For many others, the overwhelming spread of evil will do them in. Nothing left of their love but a mound of ashes. Staying with it, that's what God requires. Stay with it to the end. You won't be sorry, and you'll be saved. All during this time, the good news, the message of the kingdom, will be preached all over the world, a witness staked out in every country. And then the end will come. The Monster of Desecration But be ready to run for it when you see the monster of desecration set up in the temple sanctuary. The prophet Daniel described this. If you've read Daniel, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you're living in Judea at the time, run for the hills. If you're working in the yard, don't return to the house to get anything. If you're out in the field, don't go back and get your coat. Pregnant and nursing mothers will have it especially hard. Hope and pray this won't happen during the winter or on a Sabbath. This is going to be trouble on a scale beyond what the world has ever seen or will see again. If these days of trouble were left to run their course, nobody would make it. But on account of God's chosen people, the trouble will be cut short. The Arrival of the Son of Man If anyone tries to flag you down, calling out, Here's the Messiah, or points, There he is! Don't fall for it. Fake messiahs and lying preachers are going to pop up everywhere. Their impressive credentials and dazzling performances will pull the wool over the eyes of even those who ought to know better. But I've given you fair warning. So if they say, run to the country and see him arrive, or quick, get downtown, see him come, don't give them the time of day. The arrival of the Son of Man isn't something you go to see. He comes like swift lightning to you. Whenever you see crowds gathering, think of carrion vultures circling, moving in, hovering over a rotting carcass. You can be quite sure that it's not the living Son of Man pulling in those crowds. Following those hard times, sun will fade out, moon cloud over, stars fall out of the sky, cosmic powers tremble. Then, the arrival of the Son of Man. It will fill the skies. No one will miss it. Unready people all over the world, outsiders to the splendor and power, will raise a huge lament as they watch the Son of Man blazing out of heaven. At that same moment, he'll dispatch his angels with a trumpet blast summons, pulling in God's chosen from the four winds, from pole to pole. Take a lesson from the fig tree. From the moment you notice its buds form, the merest hint of green, you know summer's just around the corner. So it is with you. When you see all these things, you'll know he's at the door. Don't take this lightly. I'm not just saying this for some future generation, but for all of you. This age continues until all these things take place. Sky and earth will wear out. My words won't wear out. But the exact day and hour? No one knows that. Not even heaven's angels. Not even the sun. Only the Father knows. The arrival of the Son of Man will take place in times like Noah's. Before the great flood, everyone was carrying on as usual, having a good time right up to the day Noah boarded the ark. They knew nothing until the flood hit and swept everything away. The Son of Man's arrival will be like that. 
Two men will be working in the field. One will be taken, one left behind. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, one left behind. So stay awake, alert. You have no idea what day your master will show up. But you do know this. You know that if the homeowner had known what time of night the burglar would arrive, he would have been there with his dogs to prevent the break-in. Be vigilant just like that. You have no idea when the Son of Man is going to show up. Who here qualifies for the job of overseeing the kitchen? A person the master can depend on to feed the workers on time each day. Someone the master can drop in on unannounced and always find him doing his job. A God-blessed man or woman, I tell you. It won't be long before the master will put this person in charge of the whole operation. But if that person only looks out for himself, and the minute the master is away does what he pleases, abusing the help and throwing drunken parties for his friends, the master is going to show up when he least expects it and make hash of him. He'll end up in the dump with the hypocrites, out in the cold, shivering, teeth chattering. The Story of the Virgins, Chapter 25 God's kingdom is like ten young virgins who took oil lamps and went out to greet the bridegroom. Five were silly and five were smart. The silly virgins took lamps, but no extra oil. The smart virgins took jars of oil to feed their lamps. The bridegroom didn't show up when they expected him, and they all fell asleep. In the middle of the night, someone yelled out, He's here! The bridegroom's here! Go out and greet him! The ten virgins got up and got their lamps ready. The silly virgin said to the smart ones, Our lamps are going out. Lend us some of your oil. They answered, There might not be enough to go around. Go buy your own. They did, but while they were out buying oil, the bridegroom arrived. When everyone who was there to greet him had gone into the wedding feast, the door was locked. Much later, the other virgins, the silly ones, showed up and knocked on the door, saying, The master, we're here. Let us in. He answered, Do I know you? I don't think I know you. So stay alert. You have no idea when he might arrive. The story about investment. It's also like a man going off on an extended trip. He called his servants together and delegated responsibilities. To one he gave $5,000, to another 2000 to a third 1000 depending on their abilities. Then he left. Right off, the first servant went to work and doubled his master's investment. The second did the same. But the man with the single thousand dug a hole and carefully buried his master's money. After a long absence, the master of those three servants came back and settled up with them. The one given $5,000 showed him how he had doubled his investment. His master commended him, Good work! You did your job well! From now on, be my partner! The servant with the 2000 showed how he also had doubled his master's investment. His master commended him, Good work! You did your job well! From now on, be my partner! The servant given 1000 said, Master, I know you have high standards and hate careless ways, that you demand the best and make no allowances for error. I was afraid I might disappoint you, so I found a good hiding place and secured your money. Here it is, safe and sound, down to the last cent. The master was furious. That's a terrible way to live. It's criminal to live cautiously like that. If you knew I was after the best, why did you do less than the least? The least you could have done would have been to invest the sum with the bankers, where at least I would have gotten a little interest. Take the thousand and give it to the one who risked the most. And get rid of this play-it-safe who won't go out on a limb. Throw him out into utter darkness. The Sheep and the Goats When he finally arrives, blazing in beauty and all his angels with him, the Son of Man will take his place on his glorious throne. Then all the nations will be arranged before him, and he will sort the people out, much as a shepherd sorts out sheep and goats, putting sheep to his right and goats to his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Enter, you who are blessed by my father. Take what's coming to you in this kingdom. It's been ready for you since the world's foundation, and here's why. I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was homeless, and you gave me a room. I was shivering, and you gave me clothes. I was sick, and you stopped the visit. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then those sheep are going to say, Master, what are you talking about? When did we ever see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we ever see you sick or in prison and come to you? Then the king will say, I'm telling you the solemn truth. Whenever you did one of these things to someone overlooked or ignored, that was me. You did it to me. 
Then he will turn to the goats, the ones on his left, and say, Get out, worthless goats. You're good for nothing but the fires of hell. And why? Because I was hungry, and you gave me no meal. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was homeless, and you gave me no bed. I was shivering, and you gave me no clothes. Sick and in prison, and you never visited. Then those goats are going to say, Master, what are you talking about? When did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or homeless or shivering or sick or in prison and didn't help? He will answer them, I'm telling the solemn truth. Whenever you failed to do one of these things to someone who was being overlooked or ignored, that was me. You failed to do it to me. Then those goats will be herded to their eternal doom, but the sheep to their eternal reward. Anointed for Burial, Chapter 26 When Jesus finished saying these things, he told his disciples, You know that the Passover comes in two days. That's when the Son of Man will be betrayed and handed over for crucifixion. At that very moment, the party of high priests and religious leaders was meeting in the chambers of the chief priest named Caiaphas, conspiring to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. They agreed that it should not be done during Passover week. We don't want a riot on our hands, they said. When Jesus was at Bethany, a guest of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him as he was eating dinner and anointed him with a bottle of very expensive perfume. When the disciples saw what was happening, they were furious. That's criminal. This could have been sold for a lot and the money handed out to the poor. When Jesus realized what was going on, he intervened. Why are you giving this woman a hard time? She has just done something wonderfully significant for me. You will have the poor with you every day for the rest of your lives, but not me. When she poured this perfume on my body, what she really did was anoint me for burial. You can be sure that wherever in the whole world the message is preached, what she has just done is going to be remembered and admired. That is when one of the twelve, the one named Judas Iscariot, went to the cable of high priests and said, What will you give me if I hand him over to you? They settled on thirty silver pieces. He began looking for just the right moment to hand him over the traitor. On the first of the days of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and said, where do you want us to prepare your Passover meal? He said, enter the city and go up to a certain man and say, the teacher says, my time is near. I and my disciples plan to celebrate the Passover meal at your house. The disciples followed Jesus' instructions to the letter and prepared the Passover meal. After sunset, he and the twelve were sitting around the table. During the meal, he said, I have something hard but important to say to you. One of you is going to hand me over to the conspirators. They were stunned and then began to ask one after another, It isn't me, is it, Master? Jesus answered, The one who hands me over is someone I eat with daily, one who passes me food at the table. In one sense, the Son of Man is entering into a way of treachery well marked by the Scriptures. No surprises here. In another sense, that man who turns him in, turns traitor to the Son of Man, better never to have been born than do this. Then Judas, already turned traitor, said, It isn't me, is it, Rabbi? Jesus said, Don't play games with me, Judas. The Bread and the Cup During the meal, Jesus took and blessed the bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples. Take, eat, this is my body. Taking the cup and thanking God, he gave it to them. Drink this, all of you. This is my blood. God's new covenant poured out for many people for the forgiveness of sins. I'll not be drinking wine from this cup again until that new day when I'll drink with you in the kingdom of my Father. They sang a hymn and went directly to Mount Olives. Gethsemane Then Jesus told them, Before the night's over, You're going to fall to pieces because of what happens to me. There's a scripture that says, I'll strike the shepherd. Helter skelter, the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I, your shepherd, will go ahead of you, leading the way to Galilee. Peter broke in. Even if everyone else falls to pieces on account of you, I won't. Don't be so sure, Jesus said. This very night, before the rooster crows up the dawn, you will deny me three times. Peter protested, Even if I had to die with you, I would never deny you. 
All the others said the same thing. Then Jesus went with them to a garden called Gethsemane and told his disciples, Stay here while I go over there and pray. Taking along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he plunged into an agonizing sorrow. Then he said, This sorrow is crushing my life out. Stay here and keep vigil with me. Going a little ahead, he fell on his face praying, My father, if there is any way, get me out of this. But please, not what I want. You. What do you want? When he came back to his disciples, he found them sound asleep. He said to Peter, Can't you stick it out with me a single hour? Stay alert. Be in prayer so you don't wander into temptation without even knowing you're in danger. There is a part of you that is eager, ready for anything in God. But there's another part that's as lazy as an old dog sleeping by the fire. He then left them a second time. Again he prayed, My father, if there is no other way than this, drinking this cup to the dregs, I'm ready. Do it your way. When he came back, he found them sound asleep. They simply couldn't keep their eyes open. This time he let them sleep on and went back a third time to pray, going over the same ground one last time. When he came back the next time, he said, Are you going to sleep on and make a night of it? My time is up. The Son of Man is about to be handed over to the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's get going. My betrayer is here. With swords and clubs. The words were barely out of his mouth when Judas, the one from the Twelve, showed up, and with him, a gang from the high priests and religious leaders brandishing swords and clubs. The betrayer had worked out a sign with them. The one I kiss, that's the one. Seize him. He went straight to Jesus, greeted him. How are you, Rabbi? And kissed him. Jesus said, Friend, why this charade? Then they came on him, grabbed him, and roughed him up. One of those with Jesus pulled his sword and, taking a swing at the chief priest's servant, cut off his ear. Jesus said, Put your sword back where it belongs. All who use swords are destroyed by swords. Don't you realize that I am able right now to call to my father? And twelve companies, more if I want them, of fighting angels would be here, battle ready. But if I did that, how would the scriptures come true that say this is the way it has to be? Then Jesus addressed the mob. What is this, coming out after me with swords and clubs, as if I were a dangerous criminal? Day after day I have been sitting in the temple teaching, and you never so much as lifted a hand against me. You've done it this way to confirm and fulfill the prophetic writings. Then all the disciples cut and ran. False Charges The gang that had seized Jesus led him before Caiaphas, the chief priest, where the religion scholars and leaders had assembled. Peter followed at a safe distance until they got to the chief priest's courtyard. Then he slipped in and mingled with the servants, watching to see how things would turn out. The high priests, conspiring with the Jewish council, tried to cook up charges against Jesus in order to sentence him to death. But even though many stepped up, making up one false accusation after another, nothing was believable. Finally, two men came forward with this. He said, I can tear down this temple of God and after three days rebuild it. The chief priest stood up and said, What do you have to say to the accusation? Jesus kept silent. Then the chief priest said, I command you by the authority of the living God to say if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus was curt. You yourself said it, and that's not all. Soon you'll see it for yourself. The Son of Man seated at the right hand of the Mighty One, arriving on the clouds of heaven. At that, the chief priest lost his temper, ripping his robes, yelling, He blasphemed! Why do we need witnesses to accuse him? You all heard him blaspheme. Are you going to stand for such blasphemy? They all said, Death! That seals his death sentence. Then they were spitting in his face and banging him around. They jeered as they slapped him. Prophesy, Messiah! Who hit you that time? Denial in the courtyard All this time, Peter was sitting out in the courtyard. One servant girl came up to him and said, You were with Jesus the Galilean. In front of everybody there, he denied it. I, I don't know what you're talking about. As he moved over toward the gate, someone else said to the people there, This man was with Jesus the Nazarene. Again he denied it, salting his denial with an oath. I, I swear, I never laid eyes on the man. Shortly after that, some bystanders approached Peter. You've got to be one of them. Your accent gives you away. 
Then he got really nervous and swore. I don't know the man. Just then, a rooster crowed. Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. He went out and cried and cried and cried. Thirty Silver Coins, Chapter 27 In the first light of dawn, all the high priests and religious leaders met and put the finishing touches on their plot to kill Jesus. They tied him up and paraded him to Pilate, the governor. Judas, the one who betrayed him, realized that Jesus was doomed. Overcome with remorse, he gave back the thirty silver coins to the high priests, saying, I've sinned. I've betrayed an innocent man. They said, What do we care? That's your problem. Judas threw the silver coins into the temple and left. Then he went out and hung himself. The high priests picked up the silver pieces, but then didn't know what to do with them. It wouldn't be right to give this, a, a payment for murder as an offering in the temple. They decided to get rid of it by buying the potter's field and using it as a burial place for the homeless. That's how the field got called Murder Meadow, a name that is stuck to this day. Then Jeremiah's words became history. They took the thirty silver pieces, the price of the one priced by some sons of Israel, and they purchased the potter's field. And so they unwittingly followed the divine instructions to the letter. Pilate Jesus was placed before the governor who questioned him. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, if you say so. But when the accusations rained down hot and heavy from the high priests and religious leaders, he said nothing. Pilate asked him, do you hear that long list of accusations? Aren't you going to say something? Jesus kept silence. Not a word from his mouth. The governor was impressed, really impressed. It was an old custom during the feast for the governor to pardon a single prisoner named by the crowd. At the time, they had the infamous Jesus Barabbas in prison. With the crowd before him, Pilate said, Which prisoner do you want me to pardon? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus the so-called Christ? He knew it was through sheer spite that they had turned Jesus over to him. While court was still in session, Pilate's wife sent him a message. Don't get mixed up in judging this noble man. I've just been through a long and troubled night because of a dream about him. Meanwhile, the high priests and religious leaders had talked the crowd into asking for the pardon of Barabbas and the execution of Jesus. The governor asked, Which of the two do you want me to pardon? They said, Barabbas! Then what do I do with Jesus, the so-called Christ? They all shouted, Nail him to a cross! He objected, But for what crime? But they yelled all the louder, Nail him to a cross! When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere and that a riot was imminent, he took a basin of water and washed his hands in full sight of the crowd, saying, I'm washing my hands of responsibility for this man's death. From now on, it's in your hands, your judge and jury. The crowd answered, We'll take the blame, we and our children after us. Then he pardoned Barabbas, but he had Jesus whipped and then handed over for crucifixion. The Crucifixion The soldiers assigned to the governor took Jesus into the governor's palace and got the entire brigade together for some fun. They stripped him and dressed him in a red toga. They plaited a crown from branches of a thorn bush and set it on his head. They put a stick in his right hand for a scepter. Then they knelt before him in mocking reverence. Bravo, king of the Jews! They said, bravo! Then they spit on him and hit him on the head with the stick. When they had had their fun, they took off the toga and put his own clothes back on him. Then they proceeded out to the crucifixion. Along the way, they came on a man from Cyrene named Simon and made him carry Jesus' cross. Arriving at Golgotha, the place they call Skull Hill, they offered him a mild painkiller, a mixture of wine and myrrh. But when he tasted it, he wouldn't drink it. After they had finished nailing him to the cross and were waiting for him to die, they whiled away the time by throwing dice for his clothes. Above his head, they had posted the criminal charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Along with him, they also crucified two criminals, one to his right, the other to his left. People passing along the road jeered, shaking their heads in mock lament. You bragged that you could tear down the temple and then rebuild it in three days, so show us your stuff. Save yourself. 
If you're really God's son, come down from that cross. The high priests, along with the religion scholars and leaders, were right there mixing it up with the rest of them, having a great time poking fun at him. He saved others, why can't he save himself? King of Israel, is he? Then let him get down from that cross. We'll all become believers then. He was so sure of God. Well, let him rescue his son now if he wants him. He did claim to be God's son, didn't he? Even the two criminals crucified next to him joined in the mockery. From noon to three, the whole earth was dark. Around mid-afternoon, Jesus groaned out of the depths, crying loudly, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some bystanders who heard him said, He's calling for Elijah. One of them ran and got a sponge soaked in sour wine and lifted it on a stick so he could drink. The others joked, Don't be in such a hurry. Let's see if Elijah comes and saves him. But Jesus, again crying out loudly, breathed his last. At that moment, the temple curtain was ripped in two, top to bottom. There was an earthquake, and rocks were split in pieces. What's more, tombs were opened up, and many bodies of believers asleep in their graves were raised. After Jesus' resurrection, they left the tombs, entered the holy city, and appeared to many. The captain of the guard and those with him, when they saw the earthquake and everything else that was happening, were scared to death. They said, this has to be the Son of God. There were also quite a few women watching from a distance, women who had followed Jesus from Galilee in order to serve him. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the Zebedee brothers. The Tomb Late in the afternoon, a wealthy man from Arimathea, a disciple of Jesus, arrived. His name was Joseph. He went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate granted his request. Joseph took the body and wrapped it in clean linens, put it in his own tomb, a new tomb only recently cut into the rock, and rolled a large stone across the entrance. Then he went off. But Mary Magdalene and the other Mary stayed, sitting in plain view of the tomb. After sundown, the high priests and Pharisees arranged a meeting with Pilate. They said, Sir, we just remembered that that liar announced while he was still alive, After three days I will be raised. We've got to get that tomb sealed until the third day. There's a good chance his disciples will come and steal the corpse and then go around saying, He's risen from the dead. Then we'll be worse off than before, the final deceit surpassing the first. Pilate told them, You will have a guard. Go ahead and secure it the best you can. So they went out and secured the tomb, sealing the stone and posting guards. Risen from the Dead, Chapter 28 After the Sabbath, as the first light of the new week dawned, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to keep vigil at the tomb. Suddenly, the earth reeled and rocked under their feet as God's angel came down from heaven, came right up to where they were standing. He rolled back the stone and then sat on it. Shafts of lightning blazed from him. His garments shimmered snow white. The guards at the tomb were scared to death. They were so frightened they couldn't move. The angel spoke to the women. There is nothing to fear here. I know you're looking for Jesus, the one they nailed to the cross. He is not here. He was raised, just as he said. Come and look at the place where he was placed. Now, get on your way quickly and tell his disciples, He is risen from the dead. He is going on ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. That's the message. The women, deep in wonder and full of joy, lost no time in leaving the tomb. They ran to tell the disciples. Then Jesus met them, stopping them in their tracks. Good morning, he said. They fell to their knees, embraced his feet, and worshipped him. Jesus said, You're holding on to me for dear life. Don't be frightened like that. Go tell my brothers that they are to go to Galilee and that I'll meet them there. Meanwhile, the guards had scattered, but a few of them went into the city and told the high priests everything that had happened. They called a meeting of the religious leaders and came up with a plan. They took a large sum of money and gave it to the soldiers, bribing them to say, His disciples came in the night and stole the body while we were sleeping. They assured them, If the governor hears about your sleeping on duty, we will make sure you don't get blamed. The soldiers took the bribe and did as they were told. That story, cooked up in the Jewish high council, is still going around. Meanwhile, the eleven disciples were on their way to Galilee, headed for the mountain Jesus had set for their reunion. 
The moment they saw him, they worshipped him. Some, though, held back, not sure about worship, about risking themselves totally. Jesus, undeterred, went right ahead and gave his charge. God authorized and commanded me to commission you. Go out and train everyone you meet, far and near, in this way of life, marking them by baptism in the threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. I'll be with you as you do this, day after day after day, right up to the end of the age.